Brokaw has been accused of sexual harassment by Linda Vester, who is a former NBC anchor. Now, in a series of videos, Vester alleged that Brokaw physically tried to force her to kiss him on two separate occasions, groped her in an NBC conference room, and showed up at her hotel room uninvited. She said the inappropriate behavior began when Brokaw groped her. She says, I'm standing there, and Tom Brokaw enters through the door and grabs me from behind and proceeds to tickle me up and down. So keep in mind that Brokaw is probably the biggest figure at NBC at the time and she is about 30 years his junior. She then details a story wherein Tom invited himself to her hotel room and says he was sitting and I was standing across the coffee table from him approximately four feet away. Now I could feel myself trembling. As I stood there, I asked in a frustrated and scared tone, what do you want from me? And he gave a look of annoyance like he couldn't believe I didn't get it. He said, an affair of more than passing affection. Oh now she God. says, I protested and I said, but you're married and I'm Catholic. Then it took a really dark turn. Uh, Tom padded the couch next to him and asked her to sit down. Uh, and then she details what happens next in this video. Take a look. As I'm trying to show him, I'm so not interested and I'm so scared. I actually decided to be more direct and I brought up a case of sexual harassment, a recent case of sexual harassment at NBC News that had caused the victim a lot of pain. And at that point, he leans over with his index finger and puts it on my mouth to silence me and says, this is our compact. And at that point, he took the same hand, reached behind my head, and tried to force me to kiss him. Wow. Uh, she detailed this event at the time in her journal. She also told a friend and colleagues uh, who have also corroborated her story. But she actually explains why she didn't go to NBC with her story. She says, there was a culture at NBC News, in my experience, where women who raise questions about misconduct get labeled as troublemakers. It can torpedo your career. I already knew that, so I didn't want to make any trouble. I mean, we've seen that culture even with the way that uh, NBC handled the Matt Lauer incident and yeah. uh, Tom Brokaw has come out he had his spokesperson sort of say that this didn't happen that anything that happened was um, you know consensual but he, that she invited him to the hotel room and that it was to get advice that's what he said publicly but then he sent an email to some of his NBC colleagues that just disparages her, completely, completely disparages her. I'm gonna read you a few excerpts and it is just so beyond. He says, I was ambushed and then perp walked across the pages of the Washington Post and Variety as an avatar of male misogyny, taken to the guillotine and stripped of any honor and achievement I had earned in more than a half a century of journalism and citizenship. I'm gonna get to the rest of this letter in a second, but I want to give you guys an opportunity to talk about just the beginning of that, using his like years of being in, in journalism <laughs> as sort of a, a oh, a but like maybe it happened, but like, well, I'm a journalist, like, okay. <laughs> or even the worst thing, the suggestion is that you should just actually sweep that under the rug mm. because my commitment to 50 years or, or however long of journalism should should um, warrant me <laughs> doing whatever is yeah. in, in my power. And it's, it's a lack of recognition of the fact that there's an abuse of power that yeah. was happening. And not confronting that maybe does really smear your, your service to journalism. And I'm sorry, that is what journalism is about, is getting to the root of the story, is investigating what happens, and to cover up a story to deceive people. I mean, I don't know how you stand by your word as a journalist if you do everything you can to hide the story. Mm. Um, I, I'm, all, I'm leaning more towards uh, the character call thing. So even if it was her who invited a married man to mm. her room, mm -hmm. he still went. And I think that we, we get down to so many questions of ethics when it comes to people because of what lines they stand on. But Right is right and wrong is wrong. Whether you're a Republican, a Democrat, a progressive, I don't care what it is. You're a married man and a woman invites you to her hotel room, right? And mm -hmm. he said allegedly to help her, but it was her who made the advances, but he met her at the advances, if that is the case, and I'm not saying that. But I'm just, the fact that 
it, it, what's shocking to me is that people are appalled when they hear about cases of sexual harassment when this mm. has been going on since the beginning of time. Well, but, but actually, he this is the investigative journalist work that he did. Yeah. He went and found out where she was staying. Mm. Exactly. And so, so yes, he put that years of journalism to use to work for, for, for harassment, for assault. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. Like, I don't care. I mean... To, to everybody can do what they want, right? If they want to cheat on their wife, like, that's up to you. But to put Duris on a woman who's just starting her career, who is trying to advance within a company, who doesn't have, you know, mm -hmm. you know, really doesn't really have the ability to say, no, stop, what you're doing is inappropriate because for fear that she might lose her job and for fear that her career might be sidelined at that point. And what's interesting is he does bring up her career a lot in this uh, letter and brings up the, her lack thereof uh, yeah. uh, when it talks about career. So she says, my embassy colleagues are bewildered that Vester, who had limited success at NBC News, a <laughs> modest career at wow. Fox, and a reputation as a colleague who had trouble with the truth, was suddenly the keeper of the flame of journalistic integrity. Mm. So, I mean, this is a lot of, you know, uh, a, a lot of fancy words, but basically he's saying, she was unsuccessful, and you shouldn't believe her. She's not. She's not telling the truth, and, well, right? And that's what happens in these sexual harassment the and sexual assault cases: is that people are told, "Don't believe the woman. She's just doing that to get her name back in. She's just doing it to get money. She's just doing it for whatever to reason." To herself. But you know what? And what, what I was saying is, if you want to cheat on your wife, you can. But mm. that makes you a liar. And so, mm. why should I believe anything that you say when you're? You, when you are uh, negotiable, and that's what I was saying. Yeah. If you want to be an adulterer, that's okay, but you're asking us to believe you, but you you lied to the woman that you've been married to yeah. all those years, and that's why his credibility is at question with me. But what I wanted to say is, I went through the comments of mm. this article, mm. and the assassination on the character of the woman was so horrific. I'll just say this, I've been sexually harassed by somebody who's really big in Hollywood. I've never spoken about it, because I know that if I do, my career will end today. So if you want to know why I haven't said anything, it's because I have children to feed, a family to take care of, and I just stay away from that person. But if you want to know why many women don't talk about it at the moment, it's because our livelihood is, uh, is, is at risk. So if you want to know why many of us don't talk about it, I'll let you know from my personal experience. If you hear about it 10 years from now, because it doesn't matter anymore to me and I can help somebody else, that is why a lot of women do not speak out about sexual harassment. At the, at the moment that it's happening. Yes, yeah, at exactly. the moment that I think that's happening. important to add because people will ask why, why, why now? Yeah. yeah, I think that's a really good point, right? Because the, yeah. the fear of, of the retribution that might happen because of it. But also, she explains that she faced a lot of PTSD because of this event. Let's go to that video real quick. But I didn't say anything because he could ruin my career. I was deeply traumatized by being groped and assaulted by Tom Brokaw. Much of my work for NBC was going to war zones and being in positions of real danger. I was nearly blown up twice. I was carjacked. I had so many close scrapes. And had some transient PTSD, but it was not a fraction of the PTSD I have suffered from this. Yeah, you can really feel the pain in, in her sort of uh, revelation there. And I mean, that's something that we've heard echoed just this week with some of the, mm -hmm. the Cosby survivors, right, who talk about this feeling choked up, feeling shaky, even just seeing him yeah. in court, that they still face this post-traumatic stress disorder from having this experience. And so, of course, if you are ex experiencing that sort of trauma, on top of fearing for your livelihood, on top of fearing for the future of your career, yeah. it's so courageous for these women who come right. out. It is such an obstacle yeah. to overcome. Right? And they don't just what? call them troublemakers in, at NBC. They're called troublemakers mm. everywhere. Right. I was just going to say, yeah. and I think I want to also address what the, um, the framework she offered, which was that what she survived in the, the culture of NBC and having, mm -hmm. um, having experienced these moments of assault from Tom Brokaw was more traumatic for her than being in a war zone. And people will probably accuse her of being hy hyperbolic. Mm -hmm. But I can also say, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add my story onto here, being in a situation where there's a hierarchy and you are one of the lower ends of the totem pole yeah. makes it actually very frightening. And for me, I even said this my last day at um, my, my PhD program at USC, 
I was talking to one of my advisors who has been my, my longtime supporter and amazing mentor, and I said, you know what? I, I even have such a difficulty stepping onto campus. It's scarier to me to step on campus than to go into a refugee camp or to mm. come out of a bomb. And I've, been, I've experienced both those things and to go to a prison as well. And of course, I don't live those things every single day, but that communicates to you how how much to the core a situation like that where you're robbed of your power completely mm -hmm. and you don't know what to do um, can affect you as it affected Linda in that video and mm -hmm. I'm you know listening to your story Ida you know what and you know it, the other thing that I saw was like he if he just groped or get over it it's not rape it's like other people want to qualify people's definition of violation to their own person like being groped takes your power away from you. It does, it's not rape, but it is it is a form of sexual assault. It, it, was, it was the I think it was the continued abuse and not knowing when it would happen over yeah. and over again. Yeah. I would assume. Yeah, I think that's a that's a component of it. And he does he mentions that in the, in his letter. He says, like she is upset over me tickling her seriously. So he admits to doing it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But can you imagine a man putting his yeah. hands on your body in the workplace? That's that's inappropriate. I mean, I think we, everybody watching this can agree that that is not an appropriate workplace uh, behavior, and that is sexual harassment, yeah. right? And no, it's not rape, but we're talking about a spectrum of sexual harassment and assault that happens, and yeah. this is on that spectrum for sure. And a few more things I want to read from his letter because I'm— like when we have these issues, right, a Me Too movement, and we're seeing more and more men who are being called out for these behaviors, their apologies, I think, speak volumes, right? Because you can see if they're remorseful, you can see if they've learned, you can see their behavior. And so he clearly has not. Uh, he says, as a private citizen who married a wealthy man, he's talking about her, he's trying to get in on her for marrying somebody who's wealthy. And then, he finishes his uh, email saying, and no one woman's assault can take that away. Talking about how his family has helped with social justice efforts and whatever. So he has decided to then say that she has assaulted him by bringing to light his assault of her. Which if that is not the most sick flip of blame and culpability I've ever seen, I don't know what is, honestly. Yeah. It is just, that, like, that's it's perverse. Gross. What you just watched was one of the videos that we do today, but we actually do a whole two hour show every single day. It's a podcast, you could watch it in video or listen to it as audio. You can download it, you can stream it, and you get it completely ad free if you could become a member of the Young Turks. TYTnetwork.com slash join.